And welcome to Light Talk. This is Stan, and I'm broadcasting today from my state of the art studio in the swamps of Gainesville, Florida. Hi, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. And this is David, broadcasting from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood in Long Beach, California. And we are the Lumen Brothers. Plus one. Hey, yes, plus one. Neil's here with us. That's anyway, right. <laughs> we, we welcome to Light Talk one of my dearest and most influential mentors. Neil Peter Jampolis. Uh, we met, I met Neil many years ago in 1980, if I remember correctly. And, uh, yeah, and he was the one responsible for giving me my very first job in the theater. Uh-oh. Him and Gilbert. Yeah, I remember that. It was in New York at the League Show. And uh, so he's the blame. So everyone who doesn't like work with me, please send letters to Neil. Anyway, <laughs> but Neil, but Neil is like a, a very, very, very uh, prominent and uh, respected designer. He's done many shows. And Stan, why don't you tell our listeners a few highlights about his illustrious career? I'm going to try and get through this. So hold on to your hats, everybody. All Here right. we go. <laughs> so Neil has been working professionally as a scenic lighting and costume designer since 1966. Since 1992, he's been a professor of theater at UCLA, teaching scenic and lighting design and directing. He's done more than three dozen, that's 36 plus Broadway productions and at least that number of off-Broadway shows, as well as designing dance and directing and designing operas. Some of his most notable shows include his Tony-winning lighting for the Royal Shakespeare Company's Sherlock Holmes, Four Stall Boy, which was his first Broadway show, and the winner of the Tony for Best Play, Lily Tomlin's The Search for Signs of Intelligent Life, the musical Black and Blue, another Tony nomination, designed with his wife, Jane Reisman, I Love You, You're Perfect, Now Change, and four of the infamous Jackie Mason's Broadway shows. (laughs) Neil also designed the perennial off-Broadway production of Forever Plaid, which I did once too, and has toured all over the world. Among the directors he's worked for are Harold Pinter, Sir Peter Hall, Sir Jonathan Miller, and Tennessee Williams. Who? His opera- yeah, we've heard of him, right? <laughs> Who are these hacks? I've heard of these people. Uh, he's, he's kind of a little famous. I'm getting goosebumps. Uh, his opera work includes the Metropolitan Opera's Macbeth in 1973 and Epigenea on Torid in 2007, the premiere and European productions of Lenny Bernstein's opera A Quiet Place, Magic Flute, co-designed with Maurice Sendak, and 10 productions for the Santa Fe Opera when he was just the babe in his 20s. Imagine that. He has been principal line designer for the dance company Palabolus, who I particularly adore, since 1975, and designs dance throughout the world. With all of that behind him, it could be that Neil's just a little tired. No, <laughs> come on, yeah. not really. Welcome to the show, Neil. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Oh, it's great to have you here. Before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about that show you hired me for back in 1980. Uh, I'll just tell you a quick story. Uh, I was uh, at the league show, and uh, on that on that committee, I'm trying to remember. It was Neil. It was Ken. It was uh, Jane uh, was on J- it too. Jane was there. Uh, Lee Watson was there, <laughs> right. and of course Gilbert Hemsley. And uh, after you guys were like looking at my work, and he sat me down, and Gilbert asked, "What are you doing next year?" I said, oh, "I'm going to New York," and he said, "No, you're not." I said, what? He goes, no, you're coming down to Miami. You're going to be the resident designer at the Miami Opera because Neil, Ken, and I are doing shows there. And, you know, we like your work and we think you'd be good. And uh, then Neil turns to me and says, what are you doing next week? (laughs) And I I said, well, I'm going back to school because I, he goes, no, you're not. He goes, you're coming to Caracas, Venezuela with me to do, do you remember the name of the show, Neil? Bolivar. Yes. Bolivar. (laughs) 
Bolivar. And uh, yeah. it, it was a, a show bigger than God. And uh, <laughs> and what and I will never forget, I was uh, responsible for the panty projectors. And oh, I'll wow. never forget. And I asked Neil, I said, so are we shipping these over? He goes, no, you're going to be checking them as extra baggage. And I actually <laughs> had... <laughs> <laughs> I know how I'm big never, those are. That's I, I would never funny. forget going in Miami International yes. Airport, going to the Viasa counter, and uh, with about seven crates of projectors oh, and six three cable. Oh wow! And checking them in as extra luggage. So wow! Why don't you tell us a little bit about that show, Neil? Well, it it was uh, a a, a, bio, a biographical opera of Bolivar and. Uh, uh, they were very keen to produce it. And after they signed the contracts and I had designed it, um, uh, Venezuela went more or less bankrupt. Uh, the, their currency was devalued by 90%. Wow. So uh, uh, they didn't have the money. So they went to the government who opened a, an account in New York for me to draw on and I had to pay everybody in cash because everything was being was being built in New York, and the ponies were there and all the rest. And uh, so I got everything paid. The whole production was done with projections on a, a gray uh, structural set, and it it included the earthquake that collapsed Venezuela at one point and. Pictures of his of his ranch uh, in the countryside and all of that. It was quite romantic, and on the front curtain, which was a scrim, <laughs> there was a big uh, the, the the famous um, etching of the face of Bolivar, who is of course a secular saint mm. in Venezuela. He's from Caracas and the liberator of South America. So. Uh, so when the audience would come in, there was his face projected on the curtain. And just before we started... <laughs> I'm sorry, I remember this. Oh. <laughs> a, a fly crawled into the gate of the oh, projector. Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> and so this gigantic fly was walking <laughs> across the face of Bolivar. Up his nose. <laughs> On his nose, right? <laughs> and there's David up in the booth trying to figure out how to get the fly out of the gate before it died on his nose. Oh, that is too funny. <laughs> it was classic. It was truly classic. I can just picture that. It really that. was classic. Oh, wow. And we were, we were waiting for the on the opening night, and the house was empty. We couldn't figure out where all the people were since they told us the run was sold out. <laughs> so uh, five minutes before we were to start, and the house still empty, the president of the republic and about 50 of his closest friends came in and sat in the middle of the orchestra, and that was the audience for oh, the wow. first performance. Right. And they all turned to me so, and said, whatever you do, do not laugh. <laughs> oh, <wow. That's> right. <laughs> because there were also at every entrance if you remember neil at every entrance was a uh was was an officer with an ak-47 that's so, right <laughs> oh wow yeah. anyway, guys so, with guns and opera perfect did, combination did it have oh, a God. run after that night did it did it open yeah to yeah the it had five five sold out performances after that yeah but the opening was the private performance. So, and, and so like, the fly never came into the gate before that in rehearsals. It just showed never, up for opening. Never showed up for opening night. I guess it was a friend of the president. It must yeah. have been. <laughs> and I do remember that it was a profile of Simon Bolivar, and the yes. fly actually crawled up his nose. Oh, he right. actually went That's up right. his chin, up around, and then into it in nose. I can just picture that. That's so funny. Oh, it was classic. That is so funny. Yeah, we didn't have cell phone cameras in those days. It would have been the perfect thing to take That's a right. We wish it would have been great. Yeah, I just right. want to say in the eighties, I was you know, I'm a New Yorker and in the eighties, Neil was everywhere. Like every time you turned around, it was another Neil Peter Jam Polish show. And so I am so, you know, honored to be talking to you about your career, which leads me into the first question. So, you know, you've had an extremely distinguished career as a theater artist. So tell us a little bit how you transitioned into scenography and then even beyond that into directing. 
Well, um, as I was looking through my CV uh, to put that bio together, I noticed that about the first 20 shows that I designed professionally, I designed the scenery. Mm. And all of the shows I did, or half of them that I did in Santa Fe, I wasn't the lighting designer for. I was designing scenery and on a couple of occasions, costumes. So I've always been a sonographer. Uh, I, I was educated as a scenic designer and who did his own lighting, which was not all that common at the time. But I love doing lighting because that's what I did when I was a kid. And um, so I, I put them together. Oddly enough, I just I became a, a kind of lighting designer. But a lot of the shows that I lit on Broadway were imports from England. And they didn't bring the set. They would send the sketches and draftings. And I would put the whole thing together. I would go to the shops. I would get the bids. Mm. I would, uh, you know, work on that. So even though it said lighting by, uh, I had also put it together and done the props. And in the case of two Broadway shows, done the costumes too. Mm. So I was, I, you know, I've sort of always been a sonographer. I had done that so long that most of the people outside of New York who hired me, whether it was in regional theater or uh, opera companies or whatever, hired me to be the scenery and lighting designer. And occasionally the scenery, lighting, and costume designer. And then finally, the scenery, costume, and lighting designer and director, which makes for very small production meetings. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and you said uh, you, said you were educated as a sonographer. Where did you study? Uh, I studied at um, the Goodman Theater in Chicago mm -hmm. back when it was in the Art Institute. Right. And I got my GE requirements done at the University of Chicago, mm. where my major, which I had to have there, was in Jacobean Theater. That was a major. And that was a major. Well, oh. a major was English with a special. Then I, I wanted to study Jacobean theater. And so um, uh, so when I graduated, it was a, a joint BA, BFA degree from the Art Institute of Chicago. Interesting. Yeah, it was a, a perfect thing for a scenographer because I was surrounded by great art. The whole yeah, time. Yeah, definitely right. Chicago. Beautiful. Yeah. Hey, so Neil, yeah. our next question is one of the greatest examples of manipulating the red-green theory that I've ever yes. saw was your design of the first few minutes of Tyrandot, yeah. culminating with the entrance of the Moon Maidens. Could you please right. tell our listeners how you use how we perceive color to enhance the audience's reaction to the music and the mood? The reason why I asked this question is because at this point, when I saw Neil do this, blew my mind and made me understand everything I need to know about red and green. <laughs> you know, it's one of the shows that I've done where I can remember a cue. Yes, I will never mm. forget and what it, And what it looked like, because it was so thrilling when we did it. Uh, and the opening minutes of Turandot is this kind of orgy of violence, and it just keeps building with um, headsman's, uh, a headsman grinding his axe on a grinding wheel and the chorus calling for blood. And it just goes nuts. And all through the opening, we had a, a bunch of cues in which we started with a deep red and then we added fire effects and then we added more red and then we added still more red <laughs> until the entire stage was only lit in various shades of red and orange. And at the end of that first section, there's a phrase, you know, bum, 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 great big chord from the orchestra, and it dissolves away into 
moonlight music. And so the cue uh, was about six seconds long to go from all that red to blue. Mm. And it went to a deep blue right away in the back, uh, not on the people, uh, because I rarely do that. And, uh, And it kind of moved forward through blues and blue greens, and then finally a very pale blue-green diagonal wash of backlights uh, in moonlight color, pale blue-green, uh, to, to finish that section. And the change, the dissolve from red to blue, was startling. In that six seconds, you really, uh, uh, the red stayed in your eyes, until you kind of blinked a few times and then it was blue. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was really, uh, it was very strong. And and I hasten to add, we did it on road boards. Oh, yep. wow. Yep. Piano, piano boards. We only had piano boards at the time. It was and incredible. So no, all, that, all that planning and all those moves had to be done with guys pushing handles. Mm. At the right, and with the right counts and the right overlapping and everything else, it was hard to construct, but worth it. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, we had a lot of salamoniac smoke. Yes, yeah. we did. The good old those cones. <laughs> Can't those do that cones. tonight. <laughs> yes, what those cones were then. There was a lot of it because that's the way you did it. So I have a question about that. I didn't see the cue, but David did. But I have a sort of a visual science question, Neil. So when you did that. Did you know consciously that there was going to be this retinal delay effect as during the transition, or did you tr- was that intuition and you tried it and you said, "Holy wow, that's really great"? Um, I would say the latter. Okay. I mean, of course, of course, in, in studying, I realized it, and looking at uh, at those. Um, Examples, you know, of pictures in the blue in books with the red square and the green circle in the middle. Um, you know, I could so, sort I, of I, intuit I, it, but I'd never done it be, until that time. I imagine you've used it uh, uh, over and over again since then. Not that, not in that context, but it, but as a technique. Yeah, I mean, few operas give you the chance to do right. that. Um, the only one I did was I designed the set and lighting for. Uh, an opera uh, called The Devil and Kate, which is a Dvorak opera, which uh, the second of three acts takes place in hell. Mm. And it was lit only with red lights. Every every light that was on had a red gel in it. And so it, you were sitting in red light for about a half an hour. Mm. And then when the act ended and the curtain came down, nobody could see a thing for about three minutes because the the red was all burned in, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Neil, this is Steve in Dallas. Uh, Clearly, you've worked on Broadway. You've worked off-Broadway. Let's talk about two of your biggest hits, Forever Plaid off-Broadway and all of that work you did with Jackie Mason on Broadway. Uh, Sure. Well, Forever Plaid uh, was a a wonderful experience. When I first saw it, it was upstairs at a nightclub in a very tiny production. And and I didn't do anything on it. I just went to see it because the producer asked me. Then he said we were going to go and do a bigger production in Washington and then in a lot of other cities. And... um, would I like to design the scenery and lighting? Uh, so I said, yeah, sure. Um, but I have to go to Europe to do an opera right away. So I can do the set design for you. And um, how about have Jane do the lighting? Now, he knew both of us because we'd done a a failed Broadway show that closed out of town for him, the producer, that is. And so uh, I said to Jane, you're going to light this little show and I'm doing the set. And she said, really? Okay. How much money do we get? 
I said, we're, we're going to split a $500 fee. <laughs> <laughs> so the deal I made with the producer was that we'll take the $500, but every other theater for as long as you have the rights that you produce it in, we get to design the show. And that went on for about 12 years. Nice. And a, and a lot of productions until uh, Jane became unable to go out on some of these gigs because she was ill for a while. And so I took over the lighting, but I always used her cues and her color. Mm. So that, and it always said lighting by Jane Reisman. That's beautiful. Nice. How about Jackie? Yeah, he's a funny guy. It was on opening night of Lily Tomlin's show in Los Angeles uh, after we left Broadway. And uh, on opening night, and this man came up to me, I was, of course, in the back, and said, are you the lighting designer, the set designer for this show? I said, yeah. He said, um, uh, I'm going to produce Jackie Mason on Broadway. Would you like to design it? I said, sure. Meanwhile, when I told Jane, she was not happy about it. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I said, sure, I'll do it. And he it was his first Broadway show, that is the producers, as well as Jackie's. And he and the producer wanted it, wanted to make a name on Broadway. So he really wanted production values. Mm. And I designed five or six set changes for this show. Uh, and Jackie Mason spent the entire show in the first six feet and the middle 10 feet of the stage. Mm. That was his range. <laughs> and behind him, sets were changing. Oh, wow. <laughs> grand pianos, grand pianos were moving in and out. Chandeliers <laughs> were flying in and out. Uh, unbelievable bunch of stuff. So I went to the general manager. I said, you know, the nearest I can figure, this show is going to take 13 stagehands to run. And he said, well, it's not going to run more than six weeks and that we have that much money. So yeah, go ahead. So a year and a half later, <laughs> after, after they'd spent over a million dollars on stage oh, and fees, uh, the show closed. Wow. But it probably made money, did it not, over time? Or did oh, it, it made a lot of money, and it made Jackie Mason a lot of money. Yeah, sure. Uh, wow. And then he did three more Broadway shows, and I did all of them. Wow. I'm going to ask, so the next question is, you know, tell us about the techniques you use when working with insane people. So was Mason uh, a insane or reasonable to work with, and what about the insane people? Uh, he was reasonable to work with. Uh, but he was not reasonable to talk to. Hmm. He was extremely um, self-involved and hmm. self-referential. Everything was about him. And he was extremely right-wing, hmm. which ain't my politics at all. all right. wow. And so we would never get very far on that because he would always want to start a conversation to bait me and um, and I I wouldn't play along, but uh, you know I mean like you know he had Rudy Giuliani come backstage once and I had to show him around the set and oh, all that nice. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, he was he was not the sanest of people. You know, you work with a lot of highly creative people, and you know sometimes they're you know. Maybe insane is not the right word, but, you know, techniques that you've developed to work with people who might not be the easiest to get along with. You know? That happens a lot in opera, I found, <laughs> or did, or did happen, <laughs> because the egos are so huge. The divas. Right. Um, yeah. Yes, it's one of the reasons I started directing. Yeah, right. That's what I told my students. They said they asked me, "Well, why did you start directing?" I said, "Well, because I believe he just got tired of dealing with bad directors. <laughs> He's right. just direct this myself." <laughs> it's exactly right. It's That's exactly it. right. Okay. So, Neil, Neil, as one of your former assistants, I appreciate how well you train young lighting artists. 
Tell us about your philosophy of mentoring young theater designers. Well, the first thing is identifying talented people uh, to mentor. Uh, I, I wouldn't take someone who knew nothing, but I might take someone who was interested in theater, uh, knew something about theater history, could have an intelligent conversation about it. And my mentoring would begin by giving them a job to do and letting them do it without coaching mm. and then critiquing it. And that's still the way I teach as a graduate school uh, teacher. Uh, I, yes, of course, I teach classes where we cover some basics and, and techniques and things like dance and opera and whatever. But basically, uh, I identify people that I would like to mentor and I watch over them and I act more as a coach than as a teacher. Well, you are listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers. And this week, Light Talk is sponsored by The Mass Mutant. <laughs> <laughs> Are you working on a show that is guaranteed to end your career? Do you see your artistic integrity disappearing before your eyes? Do you anticipate serious suicidal tendencies once the New York Times reviews come out? Well, there is one way you can still save your career. Call the masked mutant to put an end to your suffering by closing that show early. The masked mutant will literally destroy that horrible show. One phone call and it's done. Hear those sirens in the night? An overwhelming feeling of well-being calms you as you know that those fire trucks are heading to that burning theater. <laughs> the masked mutant also offers less destructive means of early closure. Try his patented stinky poo atmospheric treatment. One well-placed beaver coat and your theater will be so funked up they will need an <laughs> army of hazmat specialists armed with industrial strength cleaning solutions to make that theater habitable again. <laughs> Sometimes the masked mutant makes a dramatic entrance. Watch in wonder as he rips open the RP screen to stop the rehearsal mid-production number. The masked mutant chases the frightened dancers off the stage as the creative team cheers him on. Oh, masked mutant! Please save us! As he runs out of the theater, he turns and answers, Don't worry, I will close your show long before it opens. Your assistant turns to you and asks, Who was that masked man? You answer, <laughs> That was the masked mutant. He has been saving theatrical <laughs> careers for decades. The masked mutant. It's good to know that he is there when you need him. <laughs> Easy payment options accepted. <laughs> So, Neil, please reveal <laughs> yes. the identity of the masked mutant. <laughs> the masked mutant was actually a chorus of masked mutants <laughs> that, that came on at, 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 in the climactic scene of an opera called Minutes to Midnight, which may be the worst opera I've ever worked on. Absolutely. And David worked on it, too. <laughs> but I was, I was merely the costume designer um, and had to create the masked mutant costumes. Yes. They were really called masked mutants, but that's the title of the chorus? No, they were they were supposed to be what existed after the nuclear blast. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so it was a it was a chorus of dancers in painted um, spandex tights <laughs> and tops and wearing uh, masks built on uh, fencing masks. So oh. that they had these large, no faces, right? No, right. but with no faces on them. Interesting. And and they did a, a ballet, and that was it. Right, and it, this was a particularly painful thirteen minute ballet. And one yes. night, Neil sitting behind me laughing, you know, because I was trying to light this thing with Schneider Simpson. Remember that? And Neil yes. was saying, it's time for the entrance of the masked mutant. <laughs> <laughs> and that is me coming from behind the screen, tearing it open with a knife and putting an end to this horrible ballet. But anyway, right. yeah, that was absolutely the worst opera ever. David, David was suffering all through the rehearsals because oh. uh, Sh Schneider Simpson was making life miserable for him. He was the set. De was he the director? No, no he was the no. set designer. Yeah. He was the scenic designer, uh, and he was having the terrible. Everything he did uh, 
Schneider Simpson was critiquing. And then finally we came to the first dress rehearsal and they, we got all the way through it. And Schneider, I walked over to the desk and Schneider Simpson turned to me and said, nice clothes. And that was it. <laughs> and David, behind his back, is making a fist, you know, and I'll get you. I'll get yes. you, oh, damn it. Jim Polis. <laughs> and now, back to Light Talk. So, before we continue with our listener questions, Neil has something to add to last week's discussion on the cost of graduate school. As you know, Neil is the head of design at UCLA. So, Neil, what do you want to add? I wanted to add that listening to the show, um, I wondered what universe uh, Steve and Stan were living in when they quoted what seemed to be absurdly low costs for going to graduate school. They sure aren't low in my lick of the woods. They're punishing. And worse than that, there's no funding for the students. Or what funding there is, is... Uh, uh, not regular, let's say. Uh, some years we have it, some years we don't, and some years our recruiting fails altogether because there's not enough money to pay the students for them to come because when they get here, they'll be TAing, uh, you know, teaching assistant, which means they'll be wrangling undergraduates, uh, putting on shows, and working as very close to forced labor, it seems to me. Um, at, meanwhile, their uh, costs of tuition and expenses and all the rest just go up terribly. So I would be wonderful to think that people could get through graduate school as cheaply as you guys say, but I suppose if your schools can offer full rides to students, sure, that's fine. Um, I have to say the state of California doesn't permit that in state institutions. It could be, Neil, that California is a different universe. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Maybe, well, I think it probably is. Yeah, maybe so. I, I Just to repeat, I'm amazed. Uh, we've had up and downs as well, there, but, we, but we've never, we, and we've even toyed with the idea of having students come that were not on uh, tuition waivers and assistantships, and we thought we'd be creating two classes of citizens, and they really wouldn't be able to be. It would be different That's if they it. just came to school and went home. But uh, right now, we're offering eighteen thousand dollars for nine months. Wow! With it, with a tuition waiver, uh, they pay about a thousand dollars a semester in fees, and then we offer scholarships at the end of the year, which offsets quite a bit of that if they're good students. So. It, and, and uh, we're just, I think we're just particularly lucky, perhaps. I, don't, I can't really, I don't know what it is I think you the are. Board. I was looking at the websites of some of the East Coast, uh, Northeast Coast institutions, and they, their quoted uh, prices are 56, 57,000, 48,000, 65,000 a year for graduate school. And sure, there probably would be offsets, but they'd have to be very big offsets. So, uh, you know, I think your students are lucky to, to go to school in schools that have money to give them. But one of the things about working for that money is that they're often totally burned out between doing their own shows, doing the work scholarship uh, things, and taking classes. You know, and I think a lot of it has to do also, and it's something I was trying to make clear last week, is that these are different universes that, you know, private universities, um, research universities in, in uh, different states. It's a different universe than what's happening in California and in the state schools. Um, you know, my students are, they got, they got very little money. Uh, the, the tuition's low. You know, it's only like 8000 a year. But the only, the only amount we can offer them is a work study that barely pays that. Plus, trying to live in California is very difficult, you know. So I was talking to my my students were kind of pissed off this morning, actually, because they said, hey, why didn't you talk about the state schools? You know, I'm, you know, one of my students is going to graduate with about $100,000 in debt. And it's because she's had to live. I mean, she has to pay, you know, money to live. She's been here three years. It's expensive, you know, $25,000, $30,000 a year. It's, it's not easy. 
horrible. Yeah, it's 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 very challenging, um, and it's basically creating two classes of graduate schools. And I'm afraid that the, the the one class that Neil and I belong to may not be, right. may not be around for much longer if this continues. No, it may not. I mean, our, our undergraduate classes you have to, in theater you have to beat them off with a stick, mm-hmm. and, uh, and uh, particularly musical theater. Uh, if you get you know if you're one of the hundred people who get the fifteen places, you're going to work. Yeah. Right. Because the training is so great, so good. they yeah. go right on, right to Broadway or right into yeah. you know the studios or something. That's so um, it's worth the money for an undergraduate, especially a California resident undergraduate. But uh, uh, graduate school is another animal. You know, speaking of education, I've got the next question, which is to ask you: What do you see missing in current either graduate or undergraduate education that you think you know? Those of us who are doing this, you know, are we missing anything? Or what should we be doing more of? Um, I don't think you, uh, as the teachers of design and lighting, are missing anything. I think the students are missing something Mm. because they come to us without an education that I can discern. (laughs) Or history, or knowledge of history, really. Well, that's it. They've got a degree. They have no knowledge of history or of literature. Or and even, or even result, anything that happened before their parents were born. <laughs> right. And and they don't seem in a funny way to have an interest yes, in it. True. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, when I was a kid in the 50s and the 40s even, I was looking at picture books about the silent movies, and I was fascinated with those. And then I... I always loved the theater and followed it. And the first page I read on Sunday in the New York Times was the theater section. Right, me too, yeah. Uh, and uh, so it's something I loved. Uh, people come here without a love of the theater. They loved the bro- the high school musical they were in, or lit. Hmm. But, but they don't seem to know much more of that. Steve has made the point in the past, and I think he hits on something really good, is curiosity well that's it's just, it. it's just innate curiosity about the world it's true uh i had a, a teacher i think it was when it was when i was in school and it was um i was talking about how tough it was to go to the to the university of chicago and an art school at the same time more or less and uh he said in slightly different words he said you know if all you know is theater, then you don't know theater. <laughs> right. That's good. And, right. you know, I say that to my students. It's a watchword with me. What are you going to bring to the, table. To the theater if, yeah. you have no, if you have no history, if you have no depth, if you have no curiosity, if you don't read? Right. Uh, if, you watch, uh, if you don't watch mo- films that... Uh, that date before Star Wars, uh, the the fourth revival. Uh, I just, you know, sure, you're not as old as I am, and I have a longer history, but your history doesn't seem to be as old as you are. No, it's true. We've tried to supplement that. We, we were so shocked. In the past couple of years, we've been so shocked. Names, you know, uh, uh, that they right. should know. So we, in our design studio now, we, we have infused it with... Design history. Who are the who are the the seminal names? You know, do you know who Appia is? They look at right. you. Who? <laughs> you know, how did yeah, you get here? I, not, I agree. Right. You know, one quarter of my nine quarters of graduate lighting is we read ten plays in ten weeks and talk about them. Hmm. There's a Greek play, uh, uh, a Jacobean play, a Shakespeare play to see the difference between the two. Hmm. Uh, and then I start with uh, one 19th century play, usually uh, a European, Ibsen or someone. And then um, then I start with Pulitzer Prize winning plays from the U.S. O'Neill, plays from the 50s, Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller. And, uh, and up to maybe someone like Susan Laurie Parks. But 
uh, which they all seem to know. Is that because so they, they haven't read plays in their undergraduate program? That's exactly what it is. Wow. Neil, it's Steve in Dallas again. Just about everyone who knows you knows your name and, and your wife's name, Jane Reisman. You guys were amazing together as artists yeah. and, and a loving married couple. How did you two manage to have such a successful life? Well, because we knew everything about what the other was doing. Uh, there were no mysteries. Mm. And I didn't, I didn't tell uh, Jane not to critique my work. Rather, I would ask her her opinion. Mm. And she would do the same for me. And I was a better draftsman. This is before Vectorworks. I was mm. a better draftsman than she was. And so I would draft her shows. And she would uh, double check the hookup on mine and make sure that everything mm -hmm. was right. And so uh, we had that going. Then we would assist each other in the theater. We would be each other's assistants. And that would save money. Uh, but also, uh, it, it was it was great, you know. Uh, at one point, um, I had a stagehand uh, say, can I talk to you uh, on the side here? And I said, yeah. He said, I have a question. How do you let your assistant talk to you like that? <laughs> <laughs> you had no choice. <laughs> I said... I said, we go home together every night. So I, mean, I, I have no choice. Yes, exactly. Dear. Yes, right. dear. <laughs> and, and, and part of the other thing was that we both were very busy and traveling all the time. And we used to say in the first 10 years of our marriage, we were married for five. <laughs> uh, we were just apart so often that when we came back together, it was that much better. Oh, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we brought this up because one of my students asked me, is it possible? I mean, because they know about your history. They know, you know, they know about Jane. And they said, you know, they, they, they were married for so long. And, you know, we, was there any sort of competition, jealousy, artistic jealousy? And, uh, you know, and I said, no, you, you had to know Neil and Jane. And uh, yeah. it was a beautiful thing. It really was. Uh, Jane, Jane passed in December, just this last yeah. December, and we were together for 50 years. Wow. All together. Oh, God bless. 50 years. Yeah. Did she, did she love uh, Porsches as much as you did? No. I'll tell you, she had a job. Uh, you know, I had the Porsche in New York, and while we were still living in New York, she got a job for two years teaching in Bennington at Bennington College which, for, if listeners don't know, is in Vermont. Vermont, yeah. And about sure. a five or six hour drive from New York. Right. Uh, she would make it in three. She would take the Porsche. <laughs> she was always telling me to slow down. She would take the Porsche and go up the New York Thruway at 100 miles an hour to mm -hmm. get there. But she had no idea she was driving that fast because that's what Porsches are like. Yeah, what, what, what model did, she, did you guys have? That was a 911S. Yeah, 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 sweet. Had. Yeah, I have a question, yeah. Neil. The Porsche you yeah. have now, what's it, what, yes. what's it zero to 60 time? Four and a half seconds, I think. Nice. What model are you, what model are you driving now, Neil? I'm driving a Boxster. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. An all, all black, black edition Boxster. Yeah. So all the trim and everything is I black. It. It's like the Batmobile. I, I almost very, bought a Boxster, a but I ended up with an S2000. Uh, ah. I did. I, it was between those two cars. But the question, the real question is, do you ever drive it when it's cool in in L.A. with the beaver coat in the Boxster <laughs> with the top down? That's the image that I have of you. It, it hasn't been that cold yet. Never cold, that cold in L.A. Right. And the Boxster has heated seats. That's oh. true, it does. So, <laughs> I don't worry about but it. I think that's the look, the look of the, the look of that car. With Neil with the sunglasses on and the beaver coat, you know, doing eighty up the up the you know the, the four hundred five right. or something. That's what I want to say. And my black my black baseball cap that says Brooklyn. Uh, there we go. All right. There oh, we go. You wear that yeah. in Dodger Land? Oh my God! 
We're still, we're still, we're still crying in Brooklyn the, about losing the Dodgers. They were the on. Brooklyn Dodgers before they got here. I know, I know. I it's feel, man. I got pissed. That's great. Yes. Well, Me I'm going to put. I'm going to push us into the future to, to kind of sign us off. A last right. question. Okay. So, yeah. because you've been around a couple of times, and I remember Neil in the '80s, like. In all the theater crafts magazines, there was a picture of you, oh, yeah. and Roscoe was saying, you know, a light is just a light without a gobo, and Neil Peter Jampolis, and this gobo, and that gobo. And so the question is, look into your crystal ball, and yes. tell us, what do you think is the next game-changing lighting technology, and how will it change the way we create art, or will it at all? Oh, uh, the technique of getting there uh, will certainly change with the with the new equipment and all of the rest of that. It'll make it easier to do things. Mm. Um, but whether those things will advance the show is a big question for me. Yeah. Um, I I don't do uh, flash and trash razzle right. razzle dazzle right. um, because I don't think it means anything. But anything that would get me to make a more beautiful cue and move to the next cue in a beautiful, subtle way, mm. I appreciate. Yeah. And one of the problems with all of the possibilities is that because designers now can do anything, they do anything. That's the problem. Uh, right. Yeah. And they fill the stage with meaningless things just because they're fun to create and they think they look pretty. Mm -hmm. yep. But, uh, you know, uh, I would rather, s you know, I don't go as far as saying you shouldn't notice the lights. That used to be the dictum. Yeah. But I think that everybody owes the audience a show uh, from whatever direction they're coming from. And so if you can make it beautiful and beautiful enough that people say, wow, that lighting was beautiful, then I think that's great. Mm -hmm. I have no quarrel with it. But invisible lighting, the old, that whole dictum, I think, came from the period when lighting was terrible. Right. And, right. If, and if you could see the lighting, it was because it was awful. Right. And so, uh, yeah, don't do anything that people can see and criticize or that ruins the show. There's a review of the original Morning Becomes Electra written by uh, 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 Stark Young, wrote the review. This is whenever that play was in the 20s. And he said the set by Robert Edmund Jones was very pleasing, but there was a, stir a disturbing yellow light that kept hitting the side of the house. Mm. In the review in the New York Times. Yeah, that's a sad commentary on the lighting. So, of course, if he could have lit the show without everybody seeing that yellow light, he'd have been a happier man. But there weren't any ellipsoidals in those days. Right. So you had to take your chances. And if the barn door swung open a little bit, you were sunk. Yeah. yeah now we have remote-controlled shutters. Who would have ever... Yeah. I know, I know. We have all of that, and it makes it very easy. And I, you know, I'm an old guy. I can just sit in my seat in the middle of the house yeah. and do stuff. Yeah. yeah, I don't have to run up on stage and stand there with my arms out or my arms up or turn <laughs> around and look into the lights. Yeah. I send somebody up, stand there, and the light gets moved and shuttered and colored. And I'm a happy guy. It's a beautiful thing. It really well, is. From, yep. from a guy who did a lot of running for you, Neil, <laughs> up on stage. Like, David, tell him to do that. <laughs> I, must, right. I must thank you so much for being with us today. This has been a total, total blast. Awesome. Um, it was great. And uh, we, we've wanted to get you on the show for a long time. And I'm glad that you found the time to join us. So thanks, Neil. Hey, guys, that Hammond organ solo tells us once again that you've spent a precious 51 minutes <laughs> listening to Light Talk. You can listen to Light Talk every week on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, and Spotify. And don't forget to join Light Talk on Facebook so that you can post your questions and comments and subscribe on iTunes. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. In other words, when working in your theater, wear the safety equipment. Hard hats, everybody. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers. 
coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to tune in next week when we discuss how do I know if a bulb is about to die? I need some help choosing a new console for my school. What is the best material for a psych? And why do Americans always vary about size? My hands, my hands. Oh, oh, plastic. <laughs> all that and a new sponsor, Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. We will see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye, bye Neil. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Neil Peter. Goodbye. Goodbye.